Leo Grelmeyer came to Canada from Austria in 1951. Since then, he has pioneered new routes in the Canadian Rockies, climbed a new route on Denali in Alaska, and was a founding member of the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides. He was Hans Moser's partner in creating the Heli Ski Empire Canadian Mountain Holidays. Leo loves a drink and a good story. I caught up with Leo at his home in Briscoe, British Columbia on January 25th, 1997. With me it started during the war because of, because of the war with the army. We were trained well in the Hitler Jugend in those days. But uh, it was good training for us. Yeah. And uh, we had older guys looking after us, you know, teaching us somewhat primitive in those days. But at least it started the interest going. And then uh, when the war was over after the war, well, a lot of my friends were in the same situation. We went to the mountains. No, we didn't have much food in those days. I was in a, in a mountain club, like mm -hmm. they have the Alpine Club here. I was in a mountain club there, and we went together in often busloads mm -hmm. to go to the Dolomites in Italy or other places for a week or two. And again, we had uh, all the climbers that uh, were looking after us, teaching us, and uh, as rowdy as we were then, that was quite a job for them, but they were very good. The opportunity came along, you know, because Canada was looking for immigrants, for tradesmen, all that, and I uh, hopped on the boat. And Well, I came a month earlier, before Hans did, because we couldn't get the same boat anymore. You know, he signed up a couple of days later, and by that time, the boat I signed up for was already full. So I was here a month earlier, I got off the train in Edmonton and looked around and looking for the mountains. And said, Where the hell are the mountains? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we found out, well, they're about 300 miles, you know, not very far, just 300 miles. Well, <laughs> I figured in Austria, that's 450 kilometers, I'd be out of the country, no matter which direction I go. And they think this is not far. Yeah. Well, to Canadians, this may not be far, but to an Austrian, it was an awful long distance. So then Hans arrived a month later, and we stayed there until June, because I broke my leg very bad in February. And then, uh, so we stayed till June, and then we came to Calgary. At least from there, we could see the mountains. We got to know some people from the Alpine Club already, and they took us along uh, to Eisenhower, Castle Mountain today. And uh, that was my first mountain I climbed. And I think that was in late August. 52, you know, and then, well, then we did Yamnaska in mm -hmm. November, 52. In 52, were, were you planning on climbing yeah, the cliff? Yeah, because Hans tried once before with March Bugler, March Hind today. Yeah. And a little further east from there, it was a little lower, but I wasn't very mobile yet with my leg. I was sta staying down in uh, Camp Chief Hector. You know, mm -hmm. and March was uh, first aid nurse there. Mm -hmm. So he went with her and they tried to climb there, but didn't succeed. I think it was quite difficult what they tackled there. So yeah. they turned back, and then in November, then we tried again, and there was Isabel Spreed. I don't know if you know of her, she's from the Alpine Club, an English girl. Mm -hmm. She came with us, and um, we succeeded on that one. Yeah. Uh, but even there, you know, it was late November, it was November 23rd, which mm -hmm. is pretty late, mm -hmm. but with a nice Indian summer, but that was the last day, good day, in fact, only half day was good, because before we got out on top, it was snowing. And I was a little worried when I looked up, the rest of that face, I thought, holy smoke, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to handle this, and I was in the lead, and so, but anyway, it yeah. turned out right, it wasn't all that bad. Yeah, and, uh, Hans told me that you led the whole climb. Yeah, well, the reason for that was because uh, we got up to the foot of the face there, and uh, Hans and Isabel, they were still fooling around, putting on their shoes, this and that, and I didn't really have any shoes, I just had street shoes. And so I started climbing up, the, that first little face there, you know. And um, then I was on top of that, by the time they got ready, 
And uh, well, to climb back down again with the kind of equipment I had, it wasn't too easy. So I said, why don't you throw me up a rope, you know? And uh, he told me up the rope, I tied it on and I was in the lead. Yeah. And that just kept the lead to the top. That's the only reason. Yeah. How did you climb the chimney? Did you climb it? Did you go inside the chimney at the top? Or? Yeah, not too far. No. But I was, in those days, I was very strong in my arms and everything. I was a plumber. So I had very, very strong hands. So I just uh, faced myself. I just walked up like this. It was beautiful. Yeah. And Hans always knew in a chimney I was the king. I could mm -hmm. beat him any day. <laughs> so he said, you better go. <laughs> it was actually fun. I didn't yeah. enjoy that. Well, that was uh, an incredible climb. And uh, you just had a pair of crepe shawl sole. I just had shoes. Yeah. Did you use any pitons? No. No, no pitons. No. Just sit on the ledge with the, holding the rope for a belay. And sure. Very <laughs> <laughs> primitive. <laughs> Good thing that nobody fell standards, off. I tell you, it would make a hair curl. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the, the Dirathisma route was... Oh, was that, that was a little more interesting. The third time, it was Heinz Karl and Hans and myself. That was in 56, I think. 57. 57? When, when oh. you got up it, it was 57. Oh, okay, okay. I'm glad you remember. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And we had a beautiful day there. And, and we already knew what to expect then, so it was somewhat easier. Yeah. You know. yeah. Um, but it did, did, no, you used pitons on that. Yeah. 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 Did you In do? fact, we used wooden wedges. Oh, did you? You know, on the second rope lines there, when you come up and there's a little bit of overhang, but we traversed over on the left underneath and then up and we drove in that's in fact was because we turned back at one time we said ah we go home we make wooden wedges and then we drive the pitons into that because we didn't have those big pitons like they have today mm -hmm. you know we just had ordinary pitons they were no good for that so we went home and made some wooden wedges and drove them in and then drove the pitons into that I don't know how much they would have helped, <laughs> but they were more moral support than anything else, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I said it always is in the first ascent, you don't know what's ahead of you. So it's one thing to climb it after it has been climbed by everybody, it's quite another thing when you're the first one there. Yes. You know, other than that, I don't think it's technically that difficult, but it was enough for us. Yeah. And then, and then you, you and, and Hans and, and Heinz started, uh, started your company, uh, Rocky Mountain Guides. Was that your first Rocky one? Mountain Guides, yeah. But that was uh, Frank Stark mm -hmm. and um, Hans and Heinz Karl. Mm -hmm. I wasn't You're, involved there yet. Weren't you? No. no. And then I came in a year later and then Frank Stark, he wanted uh, to get out of it. And so he sold me his share for $200. Mm -hmm. you know, and I took it from there on. Yeah. And then our ski touring got more and more, and then we got into the helicopter skiing because there was no stopping. Yeah. <laughs> but those, those first few years, you were uh, you operated out of the little Yobo mainly. Yeah. 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 Stanley Mitchell hat. Yeah. And uh, Rogers Pass, mm -hmm. Wheeler hat. Yeah. And Mount Assiniboine. Yeah. Those were our three main. Places we, we worked from with the ski touring. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but Yoho was the, the number one. During the summer, was there. Uh... Well, I always, at the beginning, when Hans needed me for the ski touring, okay, I was a plumber by trade and I had a job in Calgary then, and in between seasons, I always went back being a plumber again. Okay. And that went, I don't know for how many years. And then the, the plumbing always got less and less, the mountaineering and skiing got more and more, until in 66 was the last year I worked as a plumber, you know. And then uh, after that I could make enough in, in the skiing and mountaineering to support myself with just that. By then, heli skiing was going. And, yeah, 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 right. In '67, we built then the first lodge, the Bugaboo Lodge. Yeah, and uh, I was in charge there to the construction, and uh, so that was it. Yeah. So, 
And you managed the Bugaboo Lodge for yeah. 10 yeah. or 15 well, years Well, until ago. 88, I guess. Yeah. I think it was 88 when I quit as a manager and then I, I carried on as a guide until 92. And then I quit altogether. Yeah. Because my knees, well, they weren't that good anymore. After I had my third knee operation with one doctor in Seattle, this is the player, you better quit. Because otherwise you won't be walking. Yeah. I said, okay, yeah. fine. I went home, phoned Hans, I said, Hans, that's it, I'm quitting. Yeah. I said, okay, me too. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. So you both quit at the same time, did you? Yeah. 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 Well, you had it. No, I've done it long enough and I was perfectly happy. And don't forget, I was competing with 25 year old guides. Yeah. And I was 62. Come on, I'm not a fool. <laughs> yeah. And it was pretty demanding. It, I mean, it's one thing just to do guide casual. It's quite another thing to do helicopter skiing with 11 people on your back and uh, the kind of responsibly, responsibility you take on on yourself mm -hmm. in a place like this. I tell you, a lot of people think, wow, what a great job you have and, and you know, wonderful life. It's true. I wouldn't trade with anyone. But don't ever kid yourself. It is a lot of work and a lot of responsibility, yeah. you know, yeah. and it, it weighs on you. Yeah. It's just not two ways about it. No. And so I was just as happy to quit then and I'm, I'm very happy with my retirement now. I'm not looking back and feeling sorry for myself, not at all. I enjoyed what I did then and I'm enjoying very much what I do now. Yeah. And I still ski a lot. I still can go back up there any time I want. You know, to any one of the lodges, so the, the new owner, you know, after we sold the company, the, treats us very well. You know, he welcomes us wherever we want to go. So I have nothing to complain. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So. We didn't talk about McKinley, mm. the Wickersham Wall. When the weather changes up there, man, it changes. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's hard to believe. Yeah. We had two people that were very sick. And so Hans Moos and Hans Schwartz took those two down. We were at 18.5, it was our camp there. And he, those two guys left with those two other guys and he said, Leo, you take care of the camp, you know, take everything down and then follow us. Well, by the time we had everything together and we were ready to move, we couldn't move anymore. I was in the lead there and I was walking out and all of a sudden I put my foot there, there was nothing. And the, I was right on the edge. I didn't know it. So I walked back and said, anyone else wants to take the lead? No. I said, okay, we're going to dig into the snow. You could not put up a tent anymore. The, the wind was howling so strong. There was no way we could put up a tent. So we, we had a nice big drift there. So we dug a big hole. We got into it and we stayed there for two days and let it go. And we were fine. Yeah. You know, under, in a snow cave, that's the best place you can be. Yeah. It doesn't matter what happens outside. Yeah. And I think the problem on McKinley often is a lot of accidents do happen because people don't respect that kind of weather. And then they get into trouble unnecessary. Mm -hmm. You have to know when to quit, I think. And, and we, we just dug in, no problem. Let it go. For two days we were warm. You know, we had enough food, no problem. And then after that the sun came out, so we were ready. Yeah. to move in comfort again. And, uh, I think if we kept on struggling there, we would have been looking for a disaster. Yeah. Really. Unnecessary. Yeah. So the only problem was that Hans Schwartz and Hans Moser were down below with the other two guys, and they were wondering what happened to those guys up there. They didn't know where we were. That's right. So he wasn't too happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway. Were you on Alberta? Were you on the yeah. Alberta? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, yeah. that was the third ascent of Mount Alberta. Yeah, that's right, yeah. In fact, we had some Japanese that did the first ascent. When did they do that, in the third ascent? 1925. 25, okay. They came up to the Bugaboos one day, very old men. Mm -hmm. They wanted to do, meet me. They knew I was one of them that did the third ascent. And they wanted to talk, they couldn't talk English. <laughs> it was funny. But really nice people, mm -hmm. very nice people. And, uh, so I got to know them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did the first ascent there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and how that did that... That was pretty rotten rock up there. Was it? Yeah. Oh, 
Jesus, I got a hole in my head on the way down, you know, we rappelled down this one place and some rocks came down from other guys rappelling above me. Rocks came down and we didn't wear hard hats those days and I, I got one hell of a hole in my head the blood was running down. But anyway, <laughs> and we, we didn't quite make it back so we had to stay on a little ledge overnight. We tied ourselves in and I remember once during the night I could hear this zoom, you know. It must have been a rock about the big of my head, the, the, the size of my head. Came down right in front of my face. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I tell you, I wasn't too happy there. No. So as soon as the daylight came again, we went down. down. Hans Carl was with us on that. That's right. I think so. And and Sharka Spinkova. Mm -hmm. Do you remember her? I never met her, but no. I know her name. She yeah. was quite a girl. Was she? She was a phys ed teacher in, in Toronto, Montreal, Czechoslovakian. Mm -hmm. top athlete and she did some climbing with Brian Greenwood very good climber mm -hmm. and very delicate looking figure wow <laughs> <laughs> we walked you know from the highway across the what is it the Adabasca River mm -hmm. and uh, we walked through the water with our heavy packs and uh, she took everything off except her panties and her pasilla and walked through there, I thought, holy smoke. <laughs> it was quite a sight. Yeah. So I have an interesting question. You and Hans and friends have all done, and, and, and Peter Furman and, and many other new Canadians have done so well in this country. Why, do you have any reasons why you've been so successful? We were influenced in that direction, all our surrounding, you know, in Austria, you're surrounded by mountains everywhere. You're surrounded by mountaineers. Those were, those were our idols, the great mountaineers like, uh, you know, Randall Heckmeyer and so, you know, those kind of people that we idled. And so, of course, you, you try to imitate them a bit. Like like here in Canada, the kids they look at hockey, great hockey stars, and we looked at great uh, mountain climbers. That's all. Yeah. And, uh, during the war, of course, that was uh, promoted, you know, because they needed well mountain troops. And in fact, I was trained in that direction for yeah. the mountain troops, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was only fifteen at the end of the war. Yeah. And yet we were ready. You know, we were in, in the mountains on skis and we were trained with the Panzerfaust, what they call the bazooka, to knock off the tanks. Mm -hmm. And what we supposed to do was like when the tanks come over the Alps, you know, on those mountain roads, the idea was, you know, you, you knock off the first one and the last one and then you got them all in between because they can't move. Yeah. The only problem was our Panzerfaust, after you shot one, it left a great big pile of black smoke sitting behind you. So the other tanks, they looked where the smoke was, and bang, you got it. Yeah. By the time that time came, we said, hey, I'm not that stupid. We went home. <laughs> <laughs> the hell with it. <laughs> so, I wasn't quite that yeah. dumb. Yeah. But some of my friends got themselves killed like that, you know, yeah. being fanatic and shit. A week before the end of the war? No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, Canada itself is, is pretty unique. You know, there's no question about it. I mean, I often think, do born Canadians really appreciate what they have here? Do they know what they have here? I don't think so. They take it for granted. I don't. Mm. I appreciate it. I appreciate the space I have here. As you can see, the way I live here, I can stretch out, I can stretch my elbows. Mm -hmm. When I go to Europe today, I love going over there for a holiday, I have a lot of fun and all that. But after four weeks I come back home, I tell you, I'm so glad to be back home here again. You know, I, over there I feel I'm, you know, I'm in chains. So many people everywhere. Yeah. I'm not used to that anymore. Yeah. Ah, I need my space. That's one thing I have here. Yeah. 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 And in, in the mountaineering, yeah, at the beginning, we thought, God, you know, you go to the mountains. Over there we always went to the mountains and in the evening, of course, we were in a mountain hut and somebody brings out a guitar and we start singing instantly. That, that, that's the way it was. 
Here, this doesn't happen much because there's nobody there. Yeah. For one, you know, often you, you're in a tent out there, no hut. And that was a little, well, lonely at the beginning. But today I wouldn't want it any other way. No. <laughs> I got so used to it that, yeah. oh God, no. Yeah. no. Any, That's uh, why you go to the mountains, because you want nature around you, yeah. not hundreds of people. Because it, it, it means mountaineering in Europe today. Anywhere you go in the mountains over there, there's hundreds and thousands of people. You, know, you try to climb the Matterhorn today, <laughs> people climb over each other to get to the top. Well, that's not mountaineering anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, we have it very, very good here. And, and, yeah. you know, we take a lot for granted, but we shouldn't. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny story. My first uh, helicopter I ever been in, before helicopter skiing started, I was hired by a mining uh, company in Vancouver to go up to uh, Juneau, Alaska, and then from there we flew by helicopter in to the uh, Alaskan-Canadian border to a lake, to a place called uh, Border Border Lake, I think it was called, east of Juneau about. 60, 70 miles, and there was a mountain and uh, there was a vein up there they knew of uh, molybdenum, and uh, they had a big mine down in Colorado somewhere that was running dry, and they were quite frantic to look for that stuff that they needed for an additive to steel, as far as I know. Anyway, this, um, the hell was it, Rod McCray. I think was his name from Vancouver, a mining engineer, who hired me and another guy who was the son of one of the president, early presidents of the Alpine Club. And I forgot his name. John, Phil, John Wheeler? No, Phil Brett. Oh, Phil Brett, that's right, John Brett was in John the Brett and Phil Brett was his son. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they hired him because he was the son of this Alpine Club. He wasn't that great a mountaineer. So then this guy approached me to come along, <laughs> he needed someone to help him. So I did, and then uh, I went up there, and they showed me from the air with the helicopter where that vein was. Okay, so then I left Phil behind, because I knew he would have been a liability to me. And then I climbed up, you know, to pick the samples up there, because they had to get the samples from the actual site. They found samples down below in the screen, but that's not good enough, they have to have it for actually where it is. So they taught me how to do that, and so I did. I climbed up, and it was, I don't know, four, five, six hundred feet, I forgot. It wasn't too difficult, the climbing. Lynn, can you catch that? Yeah. It wasn't that difficult, the climbing, but it was enough when you're alone, you know, with nothing. So I climbed up there, and the, in the meantime, the helicopter was standing down below on the glacier, you know, floats. And uh, I had all my samples, and then I was going to rappel down. There was no way I could put in any piton, any anchor, to rappel from. And holy shit, here I've got a rucksack full of rocks. I want to climb down this bloody thing. I wasn't too happy, but no. I curled up my rope and was getting ready, and all of a sudden I see the helicopter down below in the glacier. He was winding up. Where's he going? It was a little hill of 12E. Do you know what? No. It's a small machine, two passengers and the pilot, you know, big floats, as we landed in the water at times. He comes up right beside me, and I was standing on a ledge that was about that wide. You know, he came up like this, then there was this ledge, and there was that vein, that's where the ledge was there, and then I went up again. Okay. And we flew with no doors. No, we had no doors on it. And he comes as close as he could to me, and he's flying his machine and said, Jump! Jump! <laughs> Holy shit! You know, I mean, he's over there, like from here to that fireplace, because he couldn't come any closer because the rotor. And as I said, it was my first time I ever flew in a helicopter, and I didn't know any better. I threw the pack over, you know, and then I pushed myself up that wall and <laughs> jumped for that float. <laughs> 
and I grabbed myself by the inside the door frame and as soon as I hit he had to lift away because otherwise I would bring him down with my weight because it was a small machine and if he touches that thing with the roller it'll be all over you know <laughs> if he does it too early I miss if he does it too late we both miss I don't think I've ever been that crazy before ever after I able to do that. And the pilot too. What a stupid thing. He was from Texas. What else? <laughs> <laughs> and I jumped and I hit it and as soon as I hit he pulled away and away we went. Wow. It was a quick way out, but boy that's pretty stupid. Yeah. <laughs> if I had known then what I know today, I would have never done it. Yeah. But I survived. Lynn and I we were up at the buggy bus. And uh, once we started this heli hiking, you know, in the summer, we needed, we, we looked for something to do with those lodges in the summer. Because, you know, we used them in the winter for heli skiing and all that. But it's pretty expensive to have a lodge like this sitting there for seven, eight months doing nothing, you know. So this other guest came up with this idea about this heli hiking. Anyway, later on, most of them were Americans at that time, still are. And uh, one older man came to me one day. He saw this huge picture of Linz, the oldest picture that exists of our city, that somebody sent to Hans. And we hung it up in the living room in the bugaboos. And this guy sees that, and he found out that I was from there. So he comes to me and says, Leo, I hear you're from Linz in Austria. I said, yeah. He said, gee, he said, you know, I had a terrible experience there once. I was there in occupation after the war. It was in, I forgot, it was in 47. Yeah, 47. He said, I went by a train from Linz to Selstar, you know, which is right on my line. You know, we, we caught this train every day to go home from work to our town, which was four stops out of the city. And uh, he said, and I saw a terrible accident there. He said, I saw two kids running across the tracks, you know, they didn't go under as they should and come up and then step into the train, but they ran across the tracks and then jumped on the train on the steps and those steps were icy, they were on the outside. This was in November, you know. And one kid f jumped on it, fell between the two cars and the train ran right over him. You know, I don't know how bad it was. And Lynn was standing there and I was standing there and I said, this is impossible. I said, well, you can relax. You're looking at him. It was me. Wow. And my brother. You know, I jumped on it and, and I, I slipped, fell down. And the next step caught my heels, turned me around on the knees. And I was between the track and, and the walk, you know, which was about two and a half feet up concrete walk, you know, so you could walk straight into the train. And I was laying in there, and I waited till the train was gone. I jumped up and still caught the train. <laughs> and my brother missed it, because he thought for sure I was dead. When the train is gone, he just finds some pieces. And he was so stunned, he missed the train, but I didn't. <laughs> and this guy was standing on the platform in the back as a soldier, and watching this. This kid followed down there. And then... When I said, well, you can relax, you know, you're looking at him, he thought, no, come on now. <laughs> this is a pretty tall story. And then Lynn, my wife, said, look, I heard this story from his brother in Austria. This is not a joke. Amazing. You know, and just about 50 years later, we meet again. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like unreal. Coincidence. Oh, Christ. That's amazing. Well, anyway.